Okay, we are here today for a special interview. Um, this is Rigorously Relevant with Gina Griffin. Oh, I'm Dr. Gina Griffin now. I can say that, which is really cool. And this is my version of a video podcast, talk show, something. Um, I just really enjoy having conversations with people about research because that's the kind of geek that I am. And I'm super excited today because Dr. Jonathan Singer of Social Work Podcast and all sorts of other really cool projects is here. So welcome. Dr. Gina G, I, it's so good to talk with you. Congratulations. Um, on your doctorate. And um, thanks so much for inviting me for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. And thanks for taking some time out of your vacation to do that. So why don't we start with the basics? Why don't we talk about how you wound up as a social worker and um, how you got to this place and all of that really good stuff? Yeah. So uh, I did my undergrad at Earlham College, which is in Richmond, Indiana. And uh, I did residence life staff. And, you know, as part of residence life staff, they, they train you in reflective listening and active listening, you know, because you're there in case, you know, students on the door on the hall have things they want to talk about. And uh, I ended up taking a class uh, called counseling and psychotherapy. And I thought, this is amazing. Like, I love this. And I talked to the professor um, who is a clinical psychologist. And I said, you know, I want to do what you do how do I get a PhD in clinical psychology? And he said, well, if you want to do what I do, which is talk to people, you need to be a social worker. And I was like, what? <laughs> he was like, he's like, you know, when I did what I did back in the 60s, clinical psychology made a lot of sense. But, you know, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, really, you want to be a social worker. And I was like, oh, and it just sort of stuck in the back of my head. And then I was doing environmental organizing, um, you know, going to neighborhoods, talking with people about recycling and water and, and all sorts of things, landfills, um, environmental justice. And I found that what I loved the most wasn't actually the environmental stuff. And it wasn't the politics and it wasn't the fundraising. It was learning about people's lives and understanding why these issues were important to them. And it dawned on me one day, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I wonder if, if I can do, mo I, I wonder if this part of my job can be most of my job if I become a social worker. And so I applied to UT Austin, um, was rejected. <laughs> my mom asked me if I was gonna reapply, I said, yes. She's like, well, what did you do wrong? I was like, I don't know. She's like, you're okay. telling me you're going to reapply, but you don't know what you did wrong. I was like, okay, good point. I set up an appointment to talk with the uh, head of admissions, uh, the MSW program, Ron Benu. And, mm -hmm. and he was like, you know, I don't, honestly, I don't see why they rejected you. Are you interested in still coming? I was like, yeah. He's like, great. Orientation is on Tuesday. I was like, wait, what? And so I like, I quit my job and I got into my MSW program. And then that's how I became a social worker. Excellent. Okay, and then you have this really impressive resume. So you do all these really cool things like working with suicidology and then you started the social work podcast. And I have cited many, many of your papers. <laughs> so how did all of that sort of stuff uh, come into being? Yeah, well, uh, so my dad's a physicist and computers oh, wow. have always been in my life. I mean, he did his dissertation with punch cards, right? Oh, wow. And, and sort of these mass, you know, the massive like room size mainframes. And so he's always used computers. Um, and then when, when personal computers came around in the mid eighties, you know, we, we had one. Um, and in the late eighties, uh, or the, sorry, the mid, mid 90s when I was getting my MSW, uh, I was in the computer lab working on a computer and the guy next to me was on this thing that ended up being a chat room. You know, this is, this is 94. And yeah. he was like, oh, let me explain to you. I was like, what is this? And then by the end of our conversation, he was like, you know, you can build a website as a student. I was like, what are you talking about? And so he, he taught me how to um, uh, click reveal codes 
and or view source and copy and paste into a notepad and change things and then upload it um, as a text file and then rename the extension to .html. And as long as it said index.html, I had a website. I was like, what? So literally all this happened in an afternoon. Right. And I was so excited about it. And over the next couple of years, I ended up creating the first websites for many of the social service agencies in Austin. Um, and then what, and I'm sure you know this, um, you know, I've had this experience and I suspect lots of folks who are watching have this experience, like particularly with technology, if you know one thing more than the people you are around, you are the expert, right? Mm -hmm. And so because mm -hmm. people then come to you with questions, you yeah. find the answers because that's what we do as social workers, right? We, we figure yeah. out the answers and, <laughs> and we share them. And so then that, that sort of, put me in this space of being um, kind of the, a technologist in social work. Um, I accidentally created uh, the first electronic medical record for my social service agency. Um, it, you know, it was, it was kind of the necessity is the mother of invention. I had to write up these crisis notes and, um, and share them, right? Mm -hmm. You don't do a suicide risk assessment and just keep it to yourself, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> coordination of care, there's multiple systems. And so um, my handwriting was terrible. And I realized that I could recreate the forms using Microsoft Word because they were probably created with Microsoft Word. And then I could type out my assessments. Mm -hmm. So I started doing this for my progress notes, my assessments, things like that. I would create drop-down forms. I did all this sort of stuff. And then everybody in my unit started using them. Mm -hmm. And then I got into trouble. Because if you ever worked for a social service agency, medical records is very particular about yeah. the forms you use and have they been approved and authorized. And these were not, even though I had also included that little, little footnote there at the bottom. Yeah. And I thought I was going to get fired one day because I got called into the office um, and I was told I, I needed to stop, that mm -hmm. these were not authorized forms. And then about three weeks later, the director of the agency called me in. I was like, oh no, like, this is it. I'm done. And he was like, you know, I just came back from a conference. This is in 96. I just came back mm -hmm. from a conference and they were talking about something called electronic medical records. <laughs> and it, it seems to me that you have created your own version of them. Um, I, I agree with the director of medical records. You cannot because we don't have secure computers and, you know, there's all sorts of patient confidential information, but I'd really like you to walk us through how you did this. And if you'd like to be on the task force for, for piloting an EHR, I was like, oh, so like, so that was literally like the first time with social work and technology that that kind of got built out. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I could, I could, I could keep going on and on and on about these little moments that, that, that I was able to step into, but um, I'll pause for a second and let you ask a question if you'd like. That would be fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to keep going? Okay. Me and the dog are just hanging out, so do you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so while all that was happening, I was actually invited back to UT Austin to participate in a, a research project. And mm -hmm. between 96 and 97, um, I taught MSW students how to create websites. Mm -hmm. And the, I, the question was, um, uh, would social work students um, be able to develop professional use of self mm -hmm. through creating a web presence? Mm -hmm. And so I taught students how to create websites and we talked about what text do you use? Mm -hmm. um, what do you link to? What images are on there? And these correlated with sort of, you know, in person, like how, what, what are the words that I say when I'm communicating things professionally? What organizations do I affiliate with? And, and how do I present myself visually, right? So we had these corollaries um, and we presented it at CSWE at the annual program meeting in 1997. And people were like, social workers are never gonna be on the web. Like, that's just not what we do. Why would you teach people how to 
create them a website for themselves like that doesn't make any sense and and honestly like i mean there was some practical truth to that because it was all hand coding back then like mm -hmm. they were literally coding html which was a little bit of a problem but i i, I these days everybody thinks about their web presence you know yeah, whether I, was, I was thinking that seems so way ahead of the curve yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the electronic medical record, right? Because, and then I was also thinking, how did you talk these social work students into doing that? Because the conversations I have with people are, you know, my students don't want to do anything technical. So how did you, how did you make that happen? Well, I, it was part of this um, research project that uh, Jane Kretschmar and some other folks at UT Austin School of Social Work um, had put together. And I think the students got some money for participating, uh -huh. always an incentive, right? Especially for students, and um, you know, and they had the, and they were, and they were interested, right? Like nobody that wasn't interested participated, you know. So it was, it was this extra thing. But I agree, there are lots of students that are like, I don't know how to do that. I'm not interested in. It. I don't want to do it. it to this day. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that happened, and. And then, you know, we sort of fast forward uh, several years, I started adjunct teaching at UT Austin, um, it really in response to 9-11. Mm -hmm. my, my friends and I, like, like lots of folks, you know, when 9-11 when when happened, it was this sort of moment of reckoning. Like, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. You know, what does it mean to be, it, it was the first sort of attack on American soil um, since, you know, the, 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 the folks that kind of came to America attacked native folks, right? I mean, this is sort of the, 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 the first um, external attack and, and really thinking through what does that mean? And my colleague and I, my colleague, uh, Nate Havlick and I were like, you know what it means? It means that we really should have been required to take a crisis intervention course mm -hmm. in our grad program. And so mm -hmm. we, we created one. And we went to UT Austin and we said, can we teach this? And they looked at the syllabus and they were like, this is terrible, but we'll work with you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then um, I sort of a last minute thing was invited to teach uh, treatment of children and adolescents. And then they let me teach this crisis intervention course. Mm -hmm. And while I was teaching crisis intervention, or rather while I was prepping for it, I realized that there were no empirically supported interventions for families with suicidal kids, which is what I had been doing. Like for, you know, at that point, like eight years, I had been doing family therapy with suicidal kids. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with uh, Dean Barbara White, mm -hmm. um, the legend. Uh, and I was like, I was like, Dean White, can you, can you believe there are no empirically supported treatments for suicidal families of suicidal kids and she was like yep I was like what and she said yeah so like it's really hard to do research with families mm -hmm. right like what's the outcome does it change amongst individuals and families is it you know it's you know children are protected population mm -hmm. and uh it's it's much harder to get approval to do research with suicidal folks especially mm -hmm. suicidal kids she's like so you got those three things there mm -hmm. I was like wow well I well, I hope somebody gets around to doing it. And she looked at me and she was like, well, it should be you, Jonathan, because this is what you do anyway. I was like, wait, how do I, how do I learn to do research with suicidal kids? She's like, oh, go get a PhD. That's what you do. You get a PhD, you learn how to be a researcher. That's the degree. I was like, oh, well, I've never wanted to get a PhD. And she looked at me and she's like, she, <laughs> she just had that look like you have no excuse not to for all sorts of reasons. And so, so I went to get my uh, PhD at the University of Pittsburgh um, for a couple reasons. Some personal, my dad grew up in Pittsburgh. I, I had a cousin there, uh, mm -hmm. low cost of living. Um, mm -hmm. But also David Brent, uh, who's one of the big names in suicide prevention, um, was there and mm -hmm. um and it was there that I started the social work podcast mm -hmm. because I was looking for a way to um, to get information to my students. You know, as, when I was adjuncting during my 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 PhD program, mm -hmm. I, I, I was looking for a way for them to have access to 
the core material after mm-hmm. they graduated. And I knew mm-hmm. that they were renting textbooks and blah, blah, blah. And I also knew that the information that they were learning in class was going to be way more valuable to them once they graduated. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this was in 2006. I sort of was, you know, I was listening to This American Life and Fresh Air and some of those early podcasts and or radio mm-hmm. shows that became podcasts. And, and I was just like, oh, I'm going to do this. And so that's how the social work podcast started. And then from the social work podcast, right, again, it was a technology thing. So people were like, oh, you must know about this emerging thing called social media, which I didn't. But again, I learned, you know, Um, and then Google Plus came and I started a Google Plus group and we all hung out there for a while and it was great. And then that got shut down and you know, so one thing led to the next. And, and, and so that's, that's kind of my, my technology journey. And it, and it really did overlap with my journey into being a researcher. That'd be cool. And it satisfies my curiosity about a lot of things that I, I really had no reason to ask until now. So thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So you mentioned some of the people that you spoke with and who gave you some guidance as you were figuring these things out. Um, were there times where you struggled with finding mentors or guidance? Were there people that you really give credit for really um, helping you along the path? Like what, what was that like for you? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Barbara White, she was, uh, I mean, she was a legend. I mean, she was, I felt so grateful to have crossed paths with her. Um, David Springer, he was the associate dean um, at UT Austin School of Social Work when I was an adjunct. And even though we were very similar in age, he, he already had his doctorate. He was, you know, and so he served as a mentor in a lot of ways um, to me as I was uh, starting along this journey. Um, the... Uh, In terms of my research around suicide and suicide risk, I really found um, a professional home with the American Association of Suicidology. You know, I was I didn't I was in my my PhD program 2004 to 2008, and I uh, went to the first conference in 2006, Mm -hmm. and I it was my first conference, and I was like, oh my god, wait, everybody's talking about things that I'm totally interested in. Like, I was like, these are my people. And so I ended up finding colleagues who were interested in the same questions, right, that I was and who were a little bit further down the path than I was, right? So it's not like I was talking with people who were like, yeah, I can get you in, like, doing some research. Like, I'm the PI of a multi-million dollar NIH-funded thing, and you can do this little piece. It was like somebody who's like, hey, so I'd like to partner with you on this project. I was like, oh yeah, let's do that. Let's partner. And so, you know, I I don't know about your experience, but my experience is that, you know, you take these classes on research methods and statistics and things like that. And, but it's not, it's not until you're, sorry about that. Um, It's not until you are, um, (laughs) this is not my, oh my God. (laughs) Just keep going. Um, so, I can guarantee you that either my dog is going to show up and want to make a guest appearance, my mom is out there, and that the doorbell is going to ring. So just we're good. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, <a> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, um, uh, it wasn't until I really wanted to know the answers to the questions that I had that all those things started to make sense, right? Um, and. I mean, I, I always found statistics really hard. Like it just, it didn't come easy. And, and even research design didn't really come easy. But when I, when I actually wanted to design a hypothesis testing survey and I wanted to be able to, to analyze the data in a certain way, mm-hmm. well, all of a sudden, like, it was like, yes, of course mm-hmm. I need to know how to make sure that the, the data are normally distributed. And if they're not, how do I address that? And then like, yep. okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to look at the, I'm going to compare these group means, but what about this other thing? You know, and it was just like, that's when research really started to make sense and really get exciting. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I had, I had a similar experience. Like I, I was so mad for years that nobody explained to me that you could use statistics to quantify all these things that had to do with real life. So I was really, I was really mad that nobody explained that to me until I got to my thirties. 
So, and yeah. there's probably a teacher somewhere in my grade school who's like, but I told you that. <laughs> <laughs> you were reading Nancy Drew books behind your math book, so you just weren't listening. That's um, hilarious. <laughs> can you think of times when you were really struggling with the research? I mean, I think research in general was kind of fumbling around in the dark trying to figure out what you're doing, but were there times where you really were having a hard time figuring out what the method was going to be, how you were going to get this done, and you just really couldn't find guidance? Yeah, so when I first started working at Temple University as an assistant professor, um, I came in with these ideas about uh, kind of really doing deep qualitative work, um, uh, working with families with suicidal youth to, you know, to really kind of understand the dynamics and, and, and sort of dig through like how and why are they getting services, either professional mental health services or, you know, connecting with um, faith communities or um, neighbors or like, what was it, right? Again, qualitative, not trying to test a hypothesis, but really sort of uncover things. And, and Temple University, you know, they seemed to be on board with it. You know, they hired me. And then, uh, and then it was the Great Recession. Mm. And the School of Social Work lost its standalone status and mm. kind of got absorbed by a larger uh, college of, of um, what they called allied health professions. And, and the feedback that I got from people was, you know, your research interests are too fuzzy. Mm. Really what you need to do is um, partner with um, a hospital and do some good hypothesis testing work that will lead to uh, an intervention study that you can apply for federal funding, mm -hmm. which was never my plan. Yeah. And I was, and, and I, and I didn't have mentoring around this. Mm -hmm. Like, because there, there are a couple types of mentors, right? You've got your process mentor and you've got your content mentor. And so like, mm -hmm. like how do I get to the point where I am sort of uh, able to do uh, rich, um, trustworthy, qualitative research, mm -hmm. right? That's the process. Like, how do I do that? Like the questions about, you know, suicide risk and, and family, like that's a content thing. And what I didn't realize for a long time was that you could, you could have two or three different mentors, mm -hmm. right? So you could have somebody that was doing, that maybe had done stuff on this kind of research with families around issues of addiction or mm -hmm. something else, but nobody had ever explained that to me. And so I kind of fumbled, right? Mm -hmm. I just didn't know because I was looking for the one person who had done what I wanted to do, which in retrospect, it's like, well, if they'd already done it, <laughs> like, why would you do it? And it was, again, one of these things around mentoring that I, I didn't quite under, or it took me a long time to understand. Um, and because I didn't have the mentoring and I also didn't have the support in the School of Social Work to kind of pursue the thing that I thought I was going to pursue, I ended up pivoting. Mm -hmm. And so I did, I partnered with a hospital and I did some really interesting research and, um, uh, and that was a good experience, but mm -hmm. again, I didn't have a mentor for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just kind of making it up as I went along. Now I did reach out to a bunch of the folks that I knew through the American Association of Suicidology, folks mm -hmm. that I had, um, seen it present and, and whose work I had cited, and, and mostly they were wonderful folks like Cheryl King and uh, David Goldston and um, uh, Sean Joe, uh, mm -hmm. social worker um, out of the Brown School in St. Louis. Um, you know, these were all folks that, that were really supportive of me as I was coming up. Then now you mentioned uh, quantitative, you mentioned qualitative. Do you have a preference? Um, is there something else like mixed methods? But what is what is your position on methodology? Well, yeah. So I, I I'm I'm really driven by the question, mm -hmm. and and the and the question. Um, you know, you can't you can't answer um, a population based question with qualitative methods, right? Mm -hmm. You just can't. You have to mm -hmm. have. You have, to, you have to do quantitative stuff. And so, um, you know, some of the questions that I have now, 
uh, tend to be more quantitative than qualitative, uh, which mm -hmm. I know I know some people started out quantitative and they've moved into qualitative. But mm -hmm. you know, I, I really have questions like: Are the um, the the screeners that we use for suicide risk assessment um, are they psychometrically sound? Mm -hmm. Right? Are they um, are they panning out the same for kids depending on all sorts of demographic characteristics? Right? Mm -hmm. um, are they are they unidimensional uh, for white kids, for black kids? Uh, when you're looking at sexual and gender identity, um, nationality, geographic region, like there, we, there's just a bunch of stuff we don't know mm -hmm. about these very fundamental data collection tools. I mean that that is inherently a quantitative set of questions. Now, of course, it, you know, I think the most rigorous research would then say, and you would have a qualitative piece, like what is your experience taking these um, assessments, kids, um, staff, what is it like to um, uh, you know, develop these and create these, and do you feel partnership? And does it, you know, do you feel more confident about what you're doing once you get the data? Right. So there, there are um, corollaries in qualitative research, um, but uh, but I'm I'm definitely driven by the questions mm -hmm. and not the method. What I will say though is that um, the uh, nobody nobody told me this, but this is just kind of what I've learned along mm -hmm. the way is that. Research is something, research methods are something that you will not get right the first time. Mm. You know, they, they present it like, oh, this is an experimental design, or this is how you set up something and you're going to use linear regression and blah, blah, blah. Like, you're going to screw that up the first time you do it. There's going to be something about the methods that you're going to screw up. And so you should do it again so that you can actually do it better. And I was really judgmental when I first started my doctoral program. You know, I'd see researchers that essentially did the same kind of studies over and over and over again. I was like, ah, that's lazy. But I, I came to respect the fact that actually it, it takes a couple of times mm -hmm. to get it right. Mm -hmm. And the more I would do a particular type of thing, like I was doing a bunch of survey research for a while, mm -hmm. like I started to dive into surveys, right, as an approach to gathering data and some of the cool things you could do with that that you couldn't do with other methods. And it's not that I ended up sticking with survey research as my main approach, but like my brain started to think, mm -hmm. oh, what could we do this? What sort of hypotheses can we embed in this survey? How can we change from, you know, Likert type scales to this other type of, um, you know, response pattern so that we can do these different types of analyses? It was... <laughs> It was like totally geeky, like nerdy research, but but it was one of those things where it was an aha moment to say, you're not going to get this right the first time. You mm -hmm. should plan on doing this over and over again. And, and particularly when you think about tenure track um, faculty positions, mm -hmm. they're basically saying, look, you have five to seven years to really learn how to become an expert in the content and the method. Mm -hmm. And, and just dive into that. It's a mm -hmm. gift. So if that is not your position, if you're doing this as part of clinical work or something else, how do you deal with that? Because maybe you don't have the luxury of you know, goofing, I don't want to say goofing around, of experimenting and, and trying and failing. So then what do you do? How do you handle that when you didn't get the results that you thought you were going to get or you just really kind of messed up? Absolutely. So so the, um, the way to think about the world as a clinician is very different than the way to think about the world as a researcher. And I think this is a problem because, you know, as a clinician, I'm like, well, that research is not helpful <laughs> because I'm not going to deliver treatment A to this set of clients and treatment B to this set of clients. I'm just going to deliver one set of treatments because that's what I'm trained in. And so like when you compare these two, it's nice, but it doesn't help me. What I want to know is when my client gets angry in session, what mm -hmm. do I do next that's going to be most helpful, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this sort of process-oriented research is, is few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, but really, in terms of thinking about things, what I find is that clinicians uh, are incentivized to, to find solutions, 
to the things that their clients are, are going through. And again, I'm not saying it's sort of in a paternalistic way, like I'm going to solve your problem, but like, like what you need to do is you need to be like, okay, so you're presenting with this problem around housing. Let's mm -hmm. solve it. Mm -hmm. And if, and if that solution doesn't work, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. But as a researcher, if you find that your hypothesis didn't pan out, that's actually really exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it means that maybe the theoretical assumptions are wrong. Maybe there was a methodological issue. Maybe it was a sampling or a population issue, right? Mm -hmm. That's when sort, sort of not getting the, the expected answer, mm -hmm. that's actually research. Not you, getting the expected outcome is a huge problem in practice. Right, so in, in from the more research perspective, that's you know what your next paper is going to look like, right? Because that's the next that's the next set of problems, right? Mm -hmm. So then the kind of stuff that I'm interested in is really the intersection of those two things, right? So because that that is the kind of problem that we have, because sometimes people are delivering things that really aren't interesting to the client population. Right. So really kind of trying to get these two groups to talk to each other is a lot. It's maybe where there's a lot more rich work. I'm really stuttering today. There's a lot more rich work going forward. Right. Yeah. So, how can we make those types of things happen more often? So, I, I think it's a it's such an important question, and also I didn't answer your your previous question. Um, and so, so, no, 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 no. I I I I went off on a slightly different tangent. So, um, let me just answer the other question first, which is, um, as a clinician, because the questions are different. Mm -hmm really the methods are different, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it, it is more about the process. And mm -hmm. so this is where I think doing single system design really comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, I'm not the first person to say this, um, you know, Bruce Thayer has been talking about this since the nineties um, mm -hmm. about the importance of this to really start to look at your practice and, and to be intentional about like, okay, in this session, this is what I did and this was the outcome, right? Or this was the feedback that I received from my client about this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna do it either the same way the next time to see if there's the same outcome or I'm gonna do it differently to mm -hmm. see if there's a different outcome and I'm going to keep track. And when, when things aren't working out, I'm going to assume that it's mostly me, mm -hmm. right? And when things are working out, I'm not going to say this is mostly me, right? There's going to be some ownership on how can I do things differently to improve what's happening for my client. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I, I know that for me as a clinician, I think a lot of clinicians are like this. Like when things are going well, you're like, I'm doing a great job. And when things are not going well in our clients' lives, it's like, wow, there's a lot of shit happening in their world, mm -hmm. right? And... And there's a way that we distance ourselves from kind of the negative outcomes. And so I think that thinking about research methodology, really around single system design, around saying I, my, my, my sample is an N of one, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see how this goes, but then I'm going to reflect on that. I'm going to mm -hmm. think through that. I think that's a really important thing. I think the value of that for researchers and the relationship between researchers and uh, providers is that uh, researchers, well, for one, I think researchers have to acknowledge that the clinical situations that, that, that social workers are dealing with on a daily basis are far more complex than the research that researchers are doing, right? Mm -hmm. So there's oftentimes this perspective like, oh, you know, like, the research is too complicated for the clinicians. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, the research is written in a language that clinicians don't understand. Yeah. But actually at the end of the day, the questions you're answering are far too simple mm -hmm. to be useful to clinicians. And, and maybe some sort of structural equation, structural equation model mm -hmm. uh, might be more similar to what clinicians are having to solve mm -hmm. every single hour right? A different one, multiple variables. If I do this, how does that correlate with that? And then what's going to be the outcome? And then when this shifts, right? That level of complexity mm -hmm. um, is the experience of clinicians. And I think a lot of researchers don't appreciate that 
it's actually that the clinicians are doing more complicated analyses on a regular basis than the researchers. Mm -hmm. That said, researchers tend to be more rigorous. They have the time, they have the training. And so um, I see clinicians, I, I worked with clinicians. I definitely did this, you know, where I would screw up in the same place every time. Mm -hmm you know, and I wouldn't fix that. And that's the problem. And so, so I think there are a couple things that clinicians can do. One, um, you know, if you're working in an agency and let's say you're seeing the same kinds of kids, uh, uh, I, I worked with kids, so I said kids, but um, you know, if you're working with the same client population, you know, look and see if they're at the university in your town, if there is somebody that's doing research in that area. And if so, say, hey, I'd be happy to talk to you about my experience with this. Like most researchers would be like, wow, like mm -hmm. this is cool. This could be really helpful. I think the mm -hmm. other thing, um, you know, that that conversation could have is that um, there's this sense of um, the role of theory mm -hmm. in practice, right? In MSW programs, we talk a lot about like, oh, you, you want theory informed and this and this and what's your theory? And then people get out into practice. They're like, I'm just going to do whatever puts out the fire, right? Yeah. And, um, and I think that the thing that we don't do a lot of is we don't encourage clinicians to provide feedback as to how these theories are going, mm -hmm. right? It's like, mm -hmm. so... Yes. Okay. So even if we think about frameworks like ecological systems theory, it's like, mm -hmm. how's that working out? Like, is this actually helpful? Or right. if you're talking about a specific um, model like cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. is this working out for my clients the way the theory says it should? And if it's not, who do I provide feedback to? Mm -hmm. Because theory, because models change, right? Motivational interviewing changes because yeah. there's feedback. Um Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I think that that's a place where clinicians and researchers can partner, mm -hmm. uh, especially social work clinicians and social work researchers can partner to advance the scholarship and also um, improve what's going on for clients. It is such a great answer, and now my mind's going about a hundred miles an hour. So I'm trying to stick with the script a little bit, but I, I'm going to go back and look at that and think about that a lot. <laughs> Well, you mentioned um, geekiness, which is the place where I live. So let's pivot a little bit. And let's talk about um, data science. So what do you know about data science? Do you believe that it's helpful um, for social workers? And what are some ways that you maybe envision being able to put that into practice um, on a daily basis um, in the social work profession? Yeah. So let me just ask you, when you think of data science, what are you thinking of so that I can sort of, so we can have that conversation? Yeah, because it's, it's, I have, a, I have sort of a specific view of what it is, but I also have a broad view of what it is. I think the specifics and the technicalities of it are a set of skills, right? So learning how to code some way or another, um, or being able to use code, um, even if you're doing it in a spreadsheet, right? Because there are ways to do that in a, in a spreadsheet um, and then deliver some outcome to someone. But in general, um, really kind of looking at everything that you're working with as data, and being able to make use of that. For example, I work for a very large organization that records everything. I, I think of them as they who must not be named, so I never mentioned the name. <laughs> but we record everything. And sometimes um, I think that data just lies fallow. And I don't think anyone ever really does anything with it, so why are we collecting it? So I think that's the other way that I think of data science, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, you know, this is, I think this is a really interesting thing because, um, you know, in MSW programs, the research classes that we teach tend to be more quantitative mm -hmm. than qualitative. But I think most clinicians, at least, tend to be more qualitative in, out, in outlook, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're interested in the narrative, in the story, um, that sort of thing. And I think that the pivot to, you know, uh, and I agree with your definitions of sort of data science in terms of like, what are the data? Um, uh, I don't think that people think, I don't think that most providers think about things as data in that sense, right? They're like, oh, well, this happened and this happened, but they're not thinking about it as, as data that can be then used in aggregate or, uh, you know, to find a, a through line in a bunch of narratives. Um, and they certainly don't think about it in terms of uh, the data that are being collected by an agency, 
Mm -hmm. kind of that administrative big data. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I've done is the uh, social work grand challenges, the harness technology for social good. And one of the original working papers was called big data, which was really administrative data. And then the other mm -hmm. one was the, the one that I wrote it had to do with practice um, and technology. And, mm -hmm. you know, the administrative data paper is really about like, okay, so if you've got um, data being collected by a large social service agency, right, mm -hmm. with a bunch of mental health outcomes, but you've also got juvenile justice or juvenile legal and uh, child welfare, and you've got all these systems that have data that could be combined to uh, either hurt people or help people, because I think this is an important part of the conversation. Yeah. Who's doing that? How's it being done? Is it being done at all? To what end? Um, and, and since I've sort of alluded to this, I think that this idea of data justice mm -hmm. is really, really important. Um, uh, you know, there was a, there was a book uh, that came out, maybe it was last year, it was called The New Jim Code. And uh, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, and, 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 and it, you know, it wasn't the only book to have, have talked about this, but really it, you know, it speaks to the way that data Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, algorithms are written by people and people are biased, um, uh, that unless we're vigilant that the, these data analysis projects, these algorithms are just going to reinforce um, uh, uh, inequity, social inequities, mm -hmm. that um, any one person might find themselves advantaged or disadvantaged by an algorithm, which is typically like you know, in a black box and kind of unknown and unknowable, mm -hmm. but it's more that communities are disadvantaged by yeah. algorithms. And we don't have to think about like some big fancy, um, uh, you know, like 22nd century technology. I mean, we can think about the, you know, the algorithms that, that redlined neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know, that said that, if you live in this neighborhood, you don't qualify for a mortgage. And so, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, 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 the social justice uh, um, angle for social workers is that we, um, sorry about that. It's driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> So I think that the, um, uh, you know, the thing that social workers really should be thinking about with data is, um, yeah, what data are being collected in my agency? Mm -hmm. How are those data being used or not used by whom? Mm -hmm. um, to what end? And what are the, um, what are the unintended consequences? And then what are the intended consequences? Right, um, Tony Blair. Uh, former prime minister of Great Britain, he, I was listening to him on a podcast and he said this thing, he's like, you know, we're never surprised when good intentions lead to good outcomes. Mm -hmm. It's when good intentions lead to bad outcomes that we're surprised. And if you're at an agency and you're like, oh, well, we're doing this, we're collecting these data and it's for these good, we have good intentions. Mm -hmm. What are the possible bad outcomes that could mm -hmm. come from that? And especially when you look at it um, from the lens of racial injustice, uh, I think that's when you can start to say, oh, wait a minute, we have like disproportionate representation um, in these areas for black youth. We mm -hmm. underserve this. Our, our diagnostic categories are this, right? And so just being able to ask these questions and run reports mm -hmm. of those data can be really powerful. The mm -hmm. other thing that I think is interesting um, is, you know, with data science, I'm always thinking about what are the ways that um, social workers uh, kind of hoard opportunities and hoard knowledge that actually should be uh, more democratic or more freely accessible and available. And mm -hmm. we learn a lot of things that are valuable mm -hmm. to our clients that we don't think about like sharing. And I'm not, again, not in a paternalistic, like I will teach you things you don't know. You're right. It's not like that. It's like, if you are being trained to think about what data are out there and what's being gathered and how can we think about that, these are good conversations to have with clients mm -hmm. because 
so often our clients are being measured against an average, mm -hmm. right? And particularly if you're not a white man, the averages do not apply to you because they were oftentimes normed on white men. And so mm -hmm. then the question is for, let's say for my client, right? What are some of the data points that reflect who they are now? Mm -hmm. And if things change for them over time, how do those same data points inform that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, you know, we talk about big data, mm -hmm. right? But I think that one of the most powerful things about big data is how it provides us with small data, small in terms of individual. And so if I had this conversation with my client, I'm like, you know, you can, you can track your, your sleep habits. You can track your water intake. You can keep a diary of your mood. And like, these are your data points, mm -hmm. right? This is your data. And that baseline where you are now and where you're going to go, that's actually much more useful than thinking about, well, how did you compare to this group norm, right? Mm -hmm. This average that for lots of reasons probably was not created with other people like you, mm -hmm. whether that's race or sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, geographic, like all sorts of demographic variables. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a very powerful outlook and we don't do enough of um, uh, talking about it or training our social workers to, to think about it. Yeah, I think those are super important points and I, I absolutely agree. And I absolutely agree about you know big data versus small data. For example, um, one of the things we do regularly in trauma is um, do management-based care, right? So, you know, big data, bigger data is, you know, how is everybody in the clinic doing? Are we, right. are we getting the outcomes that we think we're gonna get? But you know, I, I regularly, you know, turn the monitor around. They have a little graph built into our electric, our electronic chart to go, hey, look, this is actually coming down. You're doing better, right? You know, and explaining to people why the MMPI team might not apply to them, you know, so don't freak out when you hear that, right? So yeah, I think, I think all that stuff is really valuable. And I think it's important for social workers to start to think of those things in terms of data, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think there's something else I'll just say that, um, I hope that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, there is kind of a revolution in the visualization mm -hmm. of our data. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that continues to create barriers uh, for um, you know, practicing social workers and then researchers is that, you know, again, so so you're an expert in R, right? Um, and you know, you, you, you know more than most social workers about R, which makes you an expert, right? So, yeah. Um, and uh, if, if somebody is scared or like about like typing things in and then like, what about what, how do I, how, like the numbers and the sort of the, the text, right? The alphanumeric stuff associated with, um, with coding and with, with, with R and some of the, um, it, it can be a barrier mm -hmm. to use. And I tip my hat to you for the work that you have done to kind of demystify and to open those doors. And I think that's exactly what we should be doing um, as folks who know. I also hope that um, there will kind of be a revolution in healthcare data to make mm -hmm. more things visual mm -hmm. so that exactly what you're talking about sort of graphs like graphs are, are great but like what are some other ways that we can visualize the uh someone's health experience of health care and and wellness over their lifetime mm -hmm. because that's when having a clinician be able to look at something and a researcher mm -hmm. they're on more even footing they're bringing different skills to it but they're yeah. a little more even footing because a clinician's going to look and they're going to be like, oh, well, this happened, but then this other thing happened. And, you yeah. know, I wonder what it was like for the family mm -hmm. when this thing happened. And the researcher might not be thinking that. Yeah. The researcher might be thinking about like, oh, well, I wonder if that went into the clinical range and this and this and that, right? Whatever it ends up being. And so that's where I think that having people come together, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of data, the visualization of data, what that means for any one person or a group of people, and mm -hmm. bringing the researcher with mm -hmm. the clinical expert together, I think that could be incredibly powerful. 
Mm -hmm. they're, they're, I know they're talking a little bit about some lifetime charts, and I think that is going to be some really cool stuff and really figuring out what that looks like. And, yeah. You know, you see some of the things starting to be integrated, like people using um, sliders and, and um, uh, I wouldn't say shiny because that's the thing that's pertinent to me with our, like, you know, the desktop slider so that other people can visualize those things and see what that looks like. So I do, yeah. I do think that's valuable. A lot of people are visual. So right. it, if you, and if you are a little bit afraid of the numbers <laughs> or you don't understand the clinical side of it, then that, I do agree, that is very good common ground. Um, we've covered some of the stuff that, um, we were gonna we were gonna talk about so I'm gonna just have a, a couple of more questions. One was definitely about diversity in research. So, do you feel that there's enough diversity in research in general? And what about social research, social work research? And then, if you do see any problems there, how can we start to change that? So, one of the things about social work and research is that I don't know that these are the exact numbers, but it's something like you know for every you know, 100 people that get an MSW, only one goes on to do research, right? Only, only one goes on to learn the skills to do research. Um, yeah. And uh, and they're absolutely 100%, you know, when you start looking at that little small, you know, one out of 100, um, mm -hmm. that 1%, there are going to be some racial biases, Mm -hmm. right? It's going to be the person who can say, yes, I can go back, right? I mean, I know that Barbara White was looking at me. She's like, okay, middle-class white guy, like, <laughs> you have no excuse not to go get your PhD, yeah. right? Um, like, do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, and I always listen to Dean White, right? So, like, that's what I did. But, um, um, so I think that understanding the, uh, the economic implications for going back and, and essentially starting over again, mm -hmm. right? Because like you can be a clinician, you know, for like 10 years and, and people in the community really respect you and you do your job well and you go mm -hmm. back for a PhD and then you are a student. Yeah. The academy says, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, you're struggling with stats, you're struggling with, you know, research design, you're feeling like an idiot. You're like, dude, what, what happened? Like, I was yeah. so good. And now I'm such an idiot. Like how did, and the, <laughs> and the Academy's like, yes, you are an idiot, you know? And that's, that's, a, <laughs> right. You know, that's a problem, especially when for lots of academic institutions and not all, not all, because I, 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 I do think that social work, in terms of racial and ethnic diversity um, and, and and sexual orientation and increasingly with gender identity. Like, I think social work does a better job than other uh, fields, certainly better than psychology, better than medicine, you know, um, nursing. Uh, but, but still, if you are, um, you know, if you're a Black woman who has uh, lots of uh, experience and respect in the community and you come back and your older white male professor is like, I don't know if you can do this. That's not just about like the work, right? That mm -hmm. there are multiple layers um, yeah. that need to be unpacked around our, our sort of historical um, uh sort of racial injustice, the way people are supported, viewed, um, signaled to, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that has historically been a problem in mm -hmm. terms of um, making sure that we had um, uh, sort of not just, I don't want to say inclusion in terms of racial and ethnic diversity, but actually sort of a, an expansion of what we saw as valuable skills and, and sort of valuable perspectives coming into the academy. Um, that said, I think that what we were talking about earlier about the relationship between researchers and clinicians mm -hmm. is one of the things that uh, both regardless of race and ethnicity, but also sort of particularly with race and ethnicity, if you have um, community members, community providers who are like, yeah, I'm in the community. I know the community. I'm working with the community. And there's a researcher who might mm -hmm. not necessarily be from this community, but sort of an adjacent community. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is a powerful way to get some answers, some questions answered. Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you're talking about um, uh, racial or ethnic groups that uh, are typically not seen 
as mm -hmm. researchers than to have someone come in and say, hey, I have some questions. You have some questions. I'm going to help you answer those questions. That means something very different than mm -hmm. if you're uh, seen as sort of the taker, right? The colonizer, uh, mm -hmm. the settler. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's huge promise and potential, um, uh, n not in terms of this sort of like conservative, like woke thing that people are, you know, you know, kind of red herring, but actually mm -hmm. saying, no, like, if you want answers, question, if you want questions answered, mm -hmm. you want to know that you can trust the answers, which means that people have to be able to trust the people asking the questions in right. the first place. And so there's actually a huge social justice, economic, racial justice reason for addressing issues of uh, racial and ethnic diversity in social work research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the stuff that I that I worked on in my capstone project addresses that. So really um, social work practice research really involves integrating as many of the people in that stream as possible into that process because who's asking the questions? Why are they asking the questions? What are the answers you're getting and how are you gonna use them? And are they relevant to the people that you're asking the questions for, right? So I clearly I have a, a, an interest in getting everybody involved in that process. And I will put in a plug for myself because I, I can be shameless. Uh, one of the things that I'm adding to the website, it's so nice being in charge of the talk show, right? <laughs> one of the things I'm adding to the website probably over the next weekend is a forum so that people can start to find each other in social work. So if you are in academia and if you are in practice and you have something in common that you wanna talk about, then hopefully it'll be a little bit easier to find each other. So just trying to tweak it a little bit and get it up there, but... Um, yeah, right. hopefully, hopefully it'll help in some small way. So last question, and then I will let you go. <laughs> Unless I hear something really good. Um, do you just have any advice that you'd like to give um, social workers, particularly people who are doing um, some of the face-to-face -face stuff um, about going out there and getting involved in research? Well, a couple things. Um, one is to, to, to understand that, um, as a clinician, you have a unique perspective and a unique way of seeing things. Um, and and when you're just when you're constantly doing therapy and you're around other clinicians, it's hard to see that mm -hmm. because everybody's thinking the same way. Everybody's asking the same question. And I'm not saying that in like a disparaging way. It's just that like that's how you know everybody's thinking along the same way, right? You can go into the break room. Or whatever it is on Zoom these days, but you can go into the break room. You can be like, "Hey, this," and they're like, "Oh, okay," and mm -hmm. and and you speak the same language, right? Yeah. So recognize that you have a distinct skill set, and particularly with social work, that your way of seeing the world is actually a little bit different than the psychologist or the family therapist or the you know the psychiatrist, um, and and to to see that as a strength. Not to be like, oh, meeting with this researcher, like I need to buy like statistics for dummies or like I need to start talking about like, like uh, randomized, you know, sample, blah. like don't do that. Mm -hmm. Go in as the clinical expert so that mm -hmm. when the clinician is like, well, we want to do this, you can be like, um, I don't really know about that because, you know, the, that measure you're talking about is actually just used as an administrative tool. Mm -hmm. You know, like literally everyone who qualifies has to get this score. And so we just give everybody that score. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually mean anything. And they're like, wait, what? And you're, you know, so you, you use your clinical skill um, and that's your expertise. So that's one of the pieces, like, like really lean in to the fact that you are a clinical expert. Um, and when the researcher says, oh, I don't know about that, assume that the researcher actually is not able to think about things the way you're thinking about them. So it doesn't mean that you're thinking about it wrong or you're talking about it wrong. You are talking about things with a particular perspective and there is value in explaining that and mm -hmm. being like, well, this is why I'm saying this. Now, if the researcher comes back and says, no, 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 I think that's great. It's just that like, that's not actually a question that we can answer given this research project or given this thing that we want to do, mm -hmm. um, then you're like, oh, okay. It, you know, so then you have that conversation. Um, the other thing that I would say is that if you're a clinician and you find that you're really digging the research, there's nothing wrong with going back for a PhD mm -hmm. and getting the skills or a doctorate and getting the skills with a DSW or a PhD and, and getting the skills to be able to take that next step because your mm -hmm. MSW program is not going to provide you with that next step. 
-hmm. It's not going to provide you with the, the, the research chops that you need to mm -hmm. take that next step. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. So those are just some, some, some thoughts that I have. Okay, excellent thoughts. Was there anything that I missed? Anything that you're dying to say? Uh, you know, I just think that, um, I hope that all social workers, um, those who are watching this and those who are hearing about it from the folks who are watching it, um, um, uh, are able to um, spend a little bit of time imagining what the future is going to mm -hmm. look like mm -hmm. and, and saying, you know, it would be great if, and then it, if you're like, but how would we do that? to think, are there things that are available now that if I knew how to do, or we were doing, could actually make that future more possible um, or more possible for everyone? I mean, there's this great quote, right? The future is is here now. It's just not evenly distributed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed or, or equitably or equally distributed. Um, and so, um, you know, thinking about like, well, what would what would a better future look like and then if that means, yeah, actually, I would love to be able to learn how to uh, use this free statistical software program like R to be able to dive into some of this information like, oh, well, Dr. G's, um, uh, you know, online tutorials are a great place to go. Like, that's an amazing resource or this other thing, right? So just to be able to give yourself permission to, 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 to wonder about like what a better future could look like and then find the things that are currently available to help get you there. Valuable information. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time out of your summer vacation to do this. I really appreciate it. So we'll it's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay. And thank you for coming to do this. Bye.